It was a sunny summer day when the lives of a group of men from Kent changed forever. British police stopped an audacious plan to import a lethal arsenal of automatic weapons from the continent across the Channel and along the River Medway in Kent. Harry Schilling, who was only 25 at the time, and his lieutenants bought the weapons on the black market in Slovakia, where they had been reactivated. The gang smuggled the arsenal in from Bologna, France, in August 2015 on a yacht they had bought especially for the operation. However, the NCA had been monitoring the gang since March, after a tip-off from Kent police, and officers were lying in wait for them when the yacht returned. Incredibly, the same underworld source supplied similar weapons to the Islamic fanatics who slaughtered 12 people at the Charlie Hedbo magazine in Paris only six months earlier. This was the largest ever seizure of automatic weapons in mainland UK. This is the incredible story of how an investigation into a crime family from Kent led to the eventual arrest and sentencing of five men for a combined total of 90 years. You are watching OCG TV. All right, crime buffs, imagine this. You wouldn't leave your safe wide open with cash spilling out, would you? Yet every day you're online, you could be doing the digital equivalent. That's why I use NordVPN. Check it out. Just like protecting my physical valuables, this is about taking zero chances. You see, the dark web is no myth. Your stolen info, passwords, they're like hot property. NordVPN hides your identity and physical location. Think of it as a vanishing act for your online activity. Stop being casual about digital crime. It's real. It was only a couple of months ago that a whopping 26 billion records were leaked online in what's considered to be the biggest data breach ever recorded. It's a lucrative business. But NordVPN turns you into a ghost by encrypting your information. Not only that, using NordVPN will also enable you to watch your favourite shows when you're abroad. So whether it's Cory in Corfu or the footy while in Fuenjarola, you'll never miss a minute. You can even extend that protection to the kids with one account protecting up to six devices. Try it for 30 days hassle-free. If it's not your new non-negotiable, you get your money back. You can get four months extra on a two-year plan with the link in the description below. Take control of your online safety. Click the link below and join the NordVPN revolution today. Chapter 1 the surveillance. The group had been known to the police for several years, with one member, Harry Schilling, leading the gang. They had been monitored for some time when intelligence indicated that there was a plan to engage in bringing handguns into the UK. The news was surprising as they had not traded in firearms before, but the group themselves were reasonably sophisticated. Further surveillance work in a pub close to the River Medway provided information that one of the gang members was searching on his phone for boats that were for sale. Naturally, this piqued the interest of detectives watching on. The River Medway is a river in the southeast of England. It rises in the High World, West Sussex, and flows through Tombridge, Maidstone, and the Medway Conurbation in Kent before emptying into the Thames Estuary near Sheerness, a total distance of 70 miles. On the 10th of August 2015, the Albanina motor cruiser made its way up the river. The boat was piloted by skipper David Payne and it sailed from Bologna hours earlier. Its destination was Cuxton via an unexpected stop-off in Rochester where, unbeknown to Payne, his every move was being watched by an armed surveillance team from the National Crime Agency. Police had first watched David Payne in a pub in Cuxton, where he had a meeting with one of the lieutenants. One of the things they identified in the pub was that he was looking on his phone or on a tablet and seemed to be looking at boats. This rang alarm bells and sparked further intrigue about what they were up to. The yacht they were buying was substantial and detectors were convinced they were going across the channel or further down in Europe so it made sense it was going to be most likely France, Belgium or maybe the Netherlands. From that moment, the 38-foot vessel, the Albanina, 
was the center of attention for officers from the NCA working around the clock. A lot of David Payne's associates were working hard on the vessel, and police believed plans were building up significantly now, so they ensured they were ready to strike. If the gang was planning to import a haul of weapons, then protecting the public while taking measures to protect the NCA team was critical. At the same time, officers needed to collect evidence of the crime, hopefully supporting a successful prosecution. The surveillance van was deployed in several places, eventually settling in a spot that gave a really good view of the boat where it was moored up in Sandwich. When David Payne left the marina and headed out towards the channel, officers still didn't know whether it was a dummy run or the real thing, and that meant deploying officers in case the boat returned loaded with illegal firearms. On the date when they returned on the Albanina, David Payne was travelling alone on the yacht. Detectives didn't know whether he'd return alone. There wasn't a clear intelligence picture about which country he was going to or really what the commodity was. They did think that from interpreting the movements and behaviour, there was criminal activity happening over that period. The team had to be ready to go at a moment's notice, with no knowledge of what was being stowed below deck in the Albanina's hold. David Payne finished his drink in his mill and made his way back from Rochester High Street to the Albanina, all the time unaware that the NCA officers were keeping a close watch. The Albanina, now fully loaded with a haul of lethal firearms, was docked in a marina on the Medway. The weapons on board could have been unloaded by the OCG and moved on to the next stage of their journey. However, the NCA still needed to build an evidential case to link David Payne to Harry Schilling. For that reason, they made the strategic decision to sit it out, keep watch on the boat and wait. Chapter 2 – Moving In One of the key challenges for the police was that Harry Schilling had been very sensible in the way that he'd been leading the enterprise. Detectives were struggling to evidentially link Harry Schilling to the boat. It'd be very difficult in court to show his connection to David Payne and even a bigger gap between evidence linking him to the firearms. If police took action to remove the threat and take the guns away, Harry Schilling and the key members of the gang would still be at large. They would still have access to the firearms. They could just turn around and carry on another run until they're successful, as they do with drugs and other commodities. Their patience was rewarded when, out of the blue, a white van pulled up alongside the vessel. Police watched as the men offloaded what appeared to be heavy suitcases from the vessel and into the van. Suspicion was added by the fact that the men were wearing blue gloves, with an obvious desire to conceal DNA. Police were certain that this was the drop that they'd been waiting for, so as the white van rolled back up the dirt track and toward the main road, four patrol cars came screeching into view and boxed it in. The operation to seize the illegal cargo had been a huge success. 22 AK-47 type weapons, nine Scorpion machine pistols and more than a thousand rounds of ammunition were recovered. Arrests were made, but it wasn't over yet. Harry Schilling was still unaware that David Payne had been arrested or that the guns had been seized. Police then received intelligence that he and his associates were in a car and on the road. Detectives knew it was time critical to get them into custody. If they got wind that Payne had been taken out, they would have been gone in a flash. Schilling and his associates would have known they'd have been looking at over 20 years if they were caught, so police moved quickly to regain control. The automatic number plate readers were showing that a vehicle associated with him was going towards Orpington and that it was heading towards a DIY store within a retail park. Police found a vehicle linked to this OCG parked up in a disabled bay and lay in wait for the gang to return to the car. Sure enough, they had been spotted coming out of a home base with shovels and other equipment that one may use to dig a large hole for burying items in. Suddenly, a flurry of cars descended upon the car park and doors were flung open as 12 armed officers closed in on the pair within a matter of seconds. By now, 
David Payne, the skipper of the Albanina, and Christopher Owen, who had helped unload the weapons, had both been arrested. At a suburban DIY store, Harry Schilling and his co-conspirator, Michael Dufresne, who was Schilling's man in Europe, were taken by surprise while shopping for tools to help them bury the weapons. Schilling was so taken aback at the arrest that he needed to be given oxygen while suffering what seemed to be a panic attack. Once they'd calmed him down, the officers soon realized a third man was missing from the scene. CCTV in the home base identifies a third man, Richard Rye, who was Schilling's trusted lieutenant, and police now had to act fast and detain him. CCTV footage shows that an officer has gone in on the search for him and identified Richard Rye, who was sitting by a window with a long cardboard box in front of him. Rye was agitated at seeing his friends arrested and was looking out of the window to monitor the goings-on, whilst desperately trying to warn the other gang members from his mobile. The officer is waiting for support before he acts. But before his support comes in, Richard Wright goes to leave the McDonald's with the box so that the officer has to take independent action and is then quickly supported by two colleagues from the covert team. The plot and the lives of the men involved were now in tatters. Chapter 3. Nail in the Coffin The operation then moved into a different phase of the investigation. Houses, properties and cars were searched for further evidence, and inside the vehicle parked at the home base were two mobile phones that would prove to be critical for the eventual court case. These were encrypted phones loaded with software known as PGP, which stood for pretty good privacy. The problem for the police was getting into them. Michael Dufresne's phone was sent off to the Metropolitan Police in London, but they struggled to gain access. Harry Schilling's phone would be sent off to Canada, and it was the recently gained experience of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police that would prove to be vital in the hunt for the smoking gun piece of evidence. The Canadians had become experts when it came to accessing encrypted phone networks, with some of the more commonly used types within the criminal fraternity having originated there. That evidence included a text message from Schilling that declared, We now officially gangsters, and another from Dufresne claiming that they were proper heavy and armed to the teeth. After all the hard work, the arrests at Cuxton Marina in Orpington and inside the McDonald's, the main work has been completed efficiently. But what happened next to the defendants was in the hands of the judge and jury, inside the most famous criminal court in the world, a long, slow process that took seven weeks. The magnitude of the potential threat posed by the gang was not lost on authorities. Throughout the trial, the defendants were whisked in and out of the Old Bailey in a police convoy as helicopters flew overhead and armed officers patrolled the streets. The bill for the armed escort alone came to a whopping £720,000. Armed officers were permitted inside the famous building for the first time since 2008, when the gang behind the £53 million Securitas Depot heist in Tonbridge stood trial. Jurors were kept in complete isolation, and there was even a line of police tape on the public gallery to stop anyone peering over to see who they were. Judge Marco Topolsky QC sentenced the gang to a combined total of over 90 years. In his summing up, he told them that they gave no thought to nor cared about the potentially devastating harm that could have been caused. He said the operation could have caused carnage on a truly horrifying scale, adding, The firearms were genuine, fully automatic and in good condition. They were of high calibre. Some of the weapons were loaded and ready to be fired. Schilling was eventually sentenced to serve a minimum of 30 years in jail, plus five years on an extended licence for gun smuggling and possessing firearms with intent to endanger life. Dufresne was given 27 years in jail, plus five years on an extended license for the same offence. Three other men, David Payne, Richard Rye and Christopher Owen Rochester, pleaded guilty at an earlier hearing and also received jail sentences for their role in the sophisticated enterprise. Payne and Rye both received 19 years. Owen, who was found with two rounds of ammunition in his pocket, received five years and four months for what was described as a lesser role. 
The sentences dished out are severe in the UK when it comes to supplying of weapons, with many offenders getting higher sentences than others who have committed what may be deemed as more serious crimes. The supply of weapons is not a business you want to get into. You have been watching OCG TV. Thanks again to today's sponsor, NordVPN. Their offering is genuinely excellent value for money. Click the link below to get four months extra on a two-year plan today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.